This is the Understanding Romans series, and in today's video class, we're going to cover Romans chapter 14, verse 14, all the way to Romans chapter 15 and verse 6, where Paul, in this passage, the heading for it, and the whole theme of it is this, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ includes the law of love that brings unity in the church. And so we're going to be dealing with that today. And so before we do, let me just encourage you, if you haven't done so already, again, subscribe to this Cornell Ministries YouTube channel. Uh, just press the little red icon on the bottom of the screen. Uh, would love to read your comments on this. Uh, you can send me an email or comment here on the thread. Uh, press the little thumbs up button. That does help. And share it with somebody else. And so, uh, But let's have a word of prayer before we get into the Word because we need the help of the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. And I want to encourage you today before we get started that God knows your needs. He knows. He sees. He hears. He, he's heard your cry. He knows what you're going through. We have a high priest that is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and praise God for that. I want to encourage you with that today before we begin and as we pray. So let's pray. Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus, the name above every name. We thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are our healer, our helper, Lord, our everything. And Lord, we thank you today. We ask and believe you, Lord, right now for the help of the Holy Holy Spirit, that Lord, you would minister to those who are watching, that God, you would minister to them today. Send the power of your Spirit. Fill them afresh, Lord. Let them be open to that, and we give you all the praise and glory. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to cover today Romans chapter 14, verse 14, all the way through chapter 15 and verse 6. It's one big section here where Paul is dealing with how the gospel, that is what Jesus has accomplished for us at the cross and his resurrection, that it includes the law of love. What is the law of love? The law of love, even though that term is not mentioned in this passage, but the law of love is basically the law of Christ, the, the, the love of Jesus. That's how he operates. That's what motivated Jesus to go to the cross. And this is so important, this passage of Romans chapter 14 and also the beginning of chapter 15. It's so important because there's so much division in the church, and Paul was dealing with that in this passage. And we touched on this last video class. I encourage you, if you have done so already, again, to watch the last video class, number 57. This is number 58. And because Paul deals in this passage the division that was in the church of his day and how to overcome that. And it's so important and relevant to our time because in the body of Christ today, as a whole, collectively, and even on a local level, get this, there can be so much division within the body of Christ. Division over race, division over politics, division over social status, division over favorite preachers, Bible translations, what music you listen to, what music you don't listen to, okay, whether or not there, we can, you, you can go to movies or what movies, all that, divisions about absolutely everything you could think about. And most of these divisions, I believe most of them fall in this category of Christian liberty. And Christian liberty is basically this truth right here. It is the differences that God allows among us as believers, okay, the differences that he allows that, that are non-essential to our salvation, and that is the aspect of Christian liberty that Paul is dealing with. So let's get into it. I'm going to put it up on the screen as I always do. And you can see it there on the screen. Uh, Romans chapter 14 and beginning with verse 14. And let me just ha say this before we I start, start reading. As Paul mentioned in the previous section, verses 1 through 13, here at chapter 14, Paul is describing two main groups. In this passage, there's the weak in Romans 14 and verse 1, and then there's the strong 
in Romans 15 and, and verse 1. But that is the, the two groups that really uh, are the undercurrent of this whole passage, two groups, weak and strong. Now, in the case of Romans, okay, both groups existed within one church. And Paul here, when he's writing about this, okay, the weak and the strong, he's not writing because he has, I believe, some previous knowledge of what was going on in the Church of Rome, even though he very likely may have. I think Paul was writing this because he knew human nature, and he knew the church as a whole in his day. He, I mean, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He had seen literally tens of thousands of Gentiles saved, and many, many Jews turned to Jesus. He had seen that in his ministry. And so he knew the flesh. He knew human nature, even among believers, that we tend to allow what divides us to be greater than what unites us. Let me say that again. Paul, I believe, understood human nature, even among believers, that is our flesh, that we have a tendency to allow what divides us, that's these non-essential to salvation issues, okay, that we allow what divides us to be greater than what unites us. And what unites us as believers, as Paul would describe in Romans chapter 14, is, is our love for Jesus that we've received from him. We love him because he first loved us and that love that was exemplified and manifested at the cross through his death, that he died for us because he loved us. And three days later, he rose from the dead to prove that the price had been paid, that the victory had been won. And so we are united by our dependency in, in Jesus, who he is, and what he has accomplished for us at the cross. Now, there are details of all of that that are different with believers, and that those details can make the difference sometimes between a strong believer and a weak believer, but that's not always the case because, because get this, a strong believer can actually know less about the details of the cross than a weak believer. Because being weak or strong is not about just simply what you know up here. Being weak or strong ultimately has to do with the heart. In the heart, am I depending every day on His work and not my own? Am I living with the heart of the cross in my life every day? And what is that heart? That it's not about me. My life is not about myself. It's about God and it's about other people. And because that was the heart of Jesus. And so that is the very heart of it. And so Paul, when he dealt with it, it is so relevant again for our time today because of the divisions that we see in the church today. And I want to emphasize that point, that what unites us as believers, as children of God in the body of Christ, whether it's collectively as a whole, universally, okay, all around the world, and also on a local level with smaller bodies of believers, what unites us is greater than what divides us. And that's not me. That's, that's the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul here in Romans chapter 14 and 15. So the question is, do we truly believe that? Okay, that's number one. Do we truly believe that? And then number two, if we truly believe that, are we going to put that into practice? Okay, are we going to put that into practice? Because putting, get this, putting that into practice can sometimes seem like it's compromise. But it's not. It's not. So let's get into uh, Romans chapter 14, beginning with verse 14, you can see it there. Paul writes, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus, that's a strong statement, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, back in Romans chapter 14 and verse 5, get this, Paul 
had made the statement that each one of us, each one of us individually, must be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, fully convinced in his own mind concerning what? Concerning the things that Paul was dealing with. Now, the main two things that Examples that the Apostle Paul used, and of course being led by the Spirit to use his examples, and these would have been hot-button issues in Paul's day. And and they may not be really, they're not, I don't think these are hot-button issues in the body of Christ today, per se, overall. Uh, that is what we eat and drink. <clears throat> and, and for example, meat that's offered to idols, okay? Meat, we, we don't really have that per se, in our culture, especially in the United States of America. That's not even an issue. Okay, when I go to Publix or Walmart, whatever, and buy some hamburgers, uh, the last thing I'm thinking about is, okay, is this offered to idols? Okay, I don't think it is, and so it's not even an issue. And even if I did know, okay, then maybe that would become an issue. But anyway, you, I can think you get the point. And the second example that Paul gave was about the days that we worship on. And what this was, was Paul was dealing with uh, some of the traditions primarily of the Jewish believers that were bring, being brought over into their relationship with God. Most likely that's what Paul is dealing with when he gives these two examples about what we eat and drink and also about what days uh, we worship the Lord on. And, and again, very likely Paul was dealing with how some of these believers, and, and this was a very diverse church in Rome, and so him writing about this was was perfect. It was it hit the nail on the head as it concerns the church in Rome because so, it was so diverse. But many of the churches in that day were very diverse, especially in the Gentile world. So with that said, Paul here is saying that in the whole context here that the weak are the ones that are fully convinced again he just he said again he said it in chapter 14 and verse 5 each one must be fully convinced in his own mind and then here Paul is saying I know and I am convinced this is Paul's personal testimony I know and I'm convinced fully convinced by the Lord Jesus it's Jesus that convinced me on this that nothing is unclean of itself but to him who considers it anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean, and also it is sin. Now, what is Paul meaning? Why is he saying this? Now, the weak that Paul was addressing were most likely those believers who were bringing a lot of their traditions over into their new covenant walk with God, and, and they were making rules out of it, at least for themselves, and maybe even possibly for other people but primarily for themselves. Again, Paul said, and I'm emphasizing this, each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. So he's talking about individuals, and again, collectively as well, but primarily individuals. The weak are those who are the ones who are more stricter, okay? They're the ones that are stricter about the days and, and about what we eat, okay, and things like that. Primarily in this context, the weak were the ones that were more stricter. And it was the strong who did not have such limitations. Now, with that said, I'm going to be clarifying that as we go through this. So here in verse 14, again, Paul is giving his own personal convictions that were given to him by the Lord Jesus. And why is it important? Because the Apostle Paul is such an example for us today. He is. And, and no, he's not Jesus. Of course not. But he is an example for us to follow. We need to be strong in the faith. Every believer. And, you know, what's interesting is that as it concerns the weak and the strong, uh, it all has to do with in the faith. Okay, we're, we're going to again do that more today. So Paul writes again here in verse 14 that there is nothing unclean in and of itself. And what, what does that mean, for, especially for us today? What does that mean? Now, in Paul's day, he was most likely referring to the food and the drink, again, that were being offered to idols, and that, that drink included wine, okay? Uh, and so, and some people say, well, biblical wine was, was non-alcoholic. Well, 
There was wine, definitely biblical wine, that was alcoholic. And I, I, I won't really get into that right now, but I'll just summarize it in that way. There was wine that was alcoholic, and with the same Greek word, there was wine that was non-alcoholic. Okay, just for, for the most part, grape juice. But the Paul would have been dealing with, with that. And, and so he's dealing with some hot-button issues in his day. And again, this was such a big thing because there was, there was traditions and things that were being brought over from Jews and most likely Gentile believers as well into their new covenant walk with God. And so there are hot button issues for believers today in the, in the church. Those hot button issues are non-essential to salvation, but again, they are hot button issues because there's so much division over, division again over, okay, is it is it all right for believers to drink wine or alcoholic beverages, okay? I know I, I'm getting you thinking, I'm even mentioning that. Some of you are like, okay, you got the answer uh, already, but these are hot button issues. Um, is it all right for believers to listen to secular music, whether rock or country or whatever? Is it all right for believers to do that? Is it all right for believers to have a tattoo on their bodies or tattoos, plural, for believers? Okay, I'm not talking about what happened before salvation. I'm talking about now after salvation for a child of God to go out and get a tattoo. Is is that all right? Okay, that's a hot button issue. Is it is it essential to salvation? No, but and so it's one of those things. Okay, and I know some of the some the wheels are turning. Like some of you, some of you are thinking, okay, oh, be careful now, pump the brakes on this. Is it all right for believers to wear jewelry? Is it all right for believers to go to the beach and have a bathing suit on? Okay, men or women, okay, is is that all right? These are things that believers would disagree with, and sometimes so much so that it would bring division. And and so much so sometimes that if a believer was to do one of these things, okay, the other believers, other believers would look at that person, believer, child of God, and say, they're not even saved. Do you, do you see the division the there that we're allowing what divides us to be greater than what unites us? And I'm not talking about some ecumenical thing that anything goes. I'm not talking about using grace as a license to sin. We're going to touch on that today, that, that actually under grace, our lives, are, our lives okay, are under even a stricter, okay, a stricter, um, um, boundary, if I could say it that way, a stricter boundary limitations than even under law. Because God's not looking so much at the outside as he is looking at the inside and our motivation. What's our motivation for doing such? Mm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's deal some more here with verse 14. So he says, but to him that considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean, or to him it is sin. Get this, here is the new covenant in action. Why? It's because God is looking at the heart and, and, and whether one is trusting in him much more than he's looking at the outside, the, the, the food, the day that we worship on, okay, whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever. He's, he's, he's not looking so much at the externals, even though he is, He's looking at the internal, the motivation by which we did the externals. And so let's move on. We're talking about this some more. Verse 15 and through uh, 18, we're going to read that. He says, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. There, there's the core of it, walking in love. That's the God's agape love. He said, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. There's, there it is right there, the death of Christ. That's, how we, that's where he manifested his love. Verse 16, Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, or that is rules and regulations about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit 
Verse 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So let's dig into these verses that we just read here. Now in these verses, 15 through 18, Paul makes the point that God's agape love, that his love that we have for him through his love for us, okay, and that we have for each other is the rule, okay, it's it's what rule, there's the law of love, okay, it's the rule by which that determines what we do or what we do not do. And Paul stated this, for example, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, a similar verse. He said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. It's the same point that Paul's making here in Romans chapter 14. And again, as I've mentioned already quite a bit, there's a lot of hot button issues that we could deal with about drinking, about even smoking, about gambling. Oh, that's another thing I didn't mention. Tattoos in the body, listening to secular music or not, going to secular events, for example, like a sporting event or even a, a secular concert. All right, or even going to a Christian concert. All right, is it, what, what is what rules the all of all of this? I just want to use my own personal testimony here for for an example. Okay, if you hear that, that's our granddaughter Evelyn. She's playing in the hallway. Um, there, I I know Christians personally that I would consider strong believers, and I believe that they are. And I know about them person, on a personal level that they sometimes listen to secular music, whether rock, or old school, or whether or country music, okay? Um, and they do that. Now, I'm just using this as an example. Now, they don't flaunt it publicly, but I know privately that they do. Now, for myself, okay, for myself, I, I don't believe it's right. For, for believers to listen to secular music. Now, that is a personal conviction for myself. Now, I know some are going to be very strong. Maybe you might even comment like, oh, no, 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 listen to secular music. That is an absolute sin, sin, okay? But I'm just using this as an example. I personally, myself, have a conviction that it is wrong. And I don't believe I don't think believers should listen, at least on a consistent basis, to secular music, regardless of what it is. Even if it's just, you know, what, and this is what some believers say. Well, some, well, I'm just listening to innocent love music, okay, that talks about the relationship, the love between a husband and wife, or whatever people, and so, you know, whatever. And they use that as their reasoning for it. Now, personally, again, I don't believe that. I don't believe believers should. But at the same time, I don't have a chapter and verse in the Bible that says, Thus saith the Lord, you shall not listen to any music except worship music. I don't have anything for that specifically states that. Now, again, I don't listen to secular music. Um, and even though in my past I have, and so I know secular songs, if I go into Walmart, okay, there might be a secular song from the 80s or 90s that's going to ring up, or 70s, actually, it's going to ring a bell with me, okay? Uh, but I'm not going home and, and, and listening, you know, look, hey, I, I listen to that, put it in my playlist, okay, and listen to that on a regular basis. But that is, that's me, okay, that's me. And, and get this, I mentioned earlier, I don't have a chapter and verse. In biblical Christianity, this is huge, in biblical Christianity as it concerns this Christian liberty, it's not about whether or not we have a chapter and verse for it, even though that would be important. But ultimately, okay, in the way that Paul was writing, it's not about whether I've got a chapter and verse for what day of the week to worship the Lord on, or if I have a chapter and verse about if I eat meat or if I don't eat meat or if I drink wine or if I don't drink wine, okay, it's not about that. As Paul would write here in verse 15, that it's about whether or not my brother or sister in the Lord is going to be grieved 
by my actions. That is what's to rule me, and that is the love of Christ. Okay, that I'm not living for myself, but I'm living for God, for Jesus, and I'm living for others. And, and so, again, it's not always about whether or not I have a chapter and verse in the Bible to do it. It's, it's about, is this going to grieve? Uh, grieve has the idea of, of sad, being sad and, and weakening the faith of another believer. Okay, is, it a, is my actions or even my attitude, okay, is, is it going to grieve another brother or sister in the Lord? And so that is what rules, okay, that is the law of love that Paul is dealing with here. And so he said here in verse 15, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, and again, we can apply this to all the non-essential things. If your brother is grieved and his, his faith is weakened, by the fact that you've got a tattoo, okay? And I'm talking about a post-salvation tattoo. And uh, if it, or is grieved by watching a movie, okay? What, whatever the case. And I know that it's weakening their faith. Paul said, you are no longer walking in love. He mentions here also in verse 15, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. And the word destroyed, again, has the idea, the same idea as, as greed, but just stronger, that it carries the idea of being weakening the faith of another to the point of possibly they losing their faith. And so that is the idea. Do not destroy the faith, okay, of another believer just for the sake of the liberty that you have in Christ to do something, okay? So there are some activities as I mentioned earlier, that for myself, that I don't participate in, whether it's privately or publicly. And, and I don't do that. It's not because I have a scripture verse for it, but it's because it's an activity that can very easily hurt another believer's walk with the Lord. Now, there are some activities, okay, that I do privately that that I never mention publicly, or if I do very little in, in private, okay, individually, um, and, and it's, it's because I know it's not wrong, but it can be taken that way. Paul would write in verse 16, look at it there, he says, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Paul is stating this, that the good meaning that that is what's permissible under the new covenant, okay? In this case, drinking particular things, uh, eating food that's even offered to idols. Under, get this, under the new covenant, there's no law about that. Uh, those were, those were uh, ceremonial laws under the old covenant, which had been fulfilled in Christ. And, and so Paul is saying that those things are good under the new covenant, but he said this, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. Now, why did he say that? The reason why is because the things that we can do in the realm of Christian liberty are most of the time in the realm of what's considered secular. Whether that's, again, an event or even a tattoo or drinking wine or gambling, whatever, that it's considered secular. And so we would... Because they're secular, it can very easily be lumped into the ball into the category of evil. So Paul says, "Do not let your good again. What's permissible under the new covenant? There's no scripture verse about it. It's fulfilled. Okay, it's all right to do it, but don't let your good be spoken of as." Evil. Now, how do we do that? It's by we carry ourselves, how we live, on our, and our actions and our attitude. Now, in verse 17, Paul writes, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when he said here, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, in other words, it's not about the rules about what we eat and what we don't eat, okay? And, and it's not about a bunch of list of laws that we can say, okay, I followed all of these laws, and so because I followed these rules, I am in the kingdom of God. 
And because I follow those rules really well, I am really prospering in the kingdom of God. Paul would say this, it's not about that. It's not about law keeping under the new covenant. But under the new covenant, what is important is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you see there the difference Paul's making, the comparison? One is primarily external. Laws about what we eat and drink, and it could it could go about anything else, okay? And then there is the in, internal righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that which Jesus purchased again through his death at the cross. That is what the kingdom of God is all about. So one is emphasizing the externals where the other is emphasizing enjoying and living in the benefits of of what Jesus has accomplished for us. All right, verse 18, he says, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by man. The point that Paul's making in verse 18 is the same that he made back in chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, where Paul was making the point that through Christ's death and resurrection, the fact that he continues to live, okay, making intercession for us, that through Jesus, okay, we don't live for ourselves. Paul would write in those verses, again, chapter 14, 7 through 9, we don't live for ourselves. Whether we live or we die, we live unto the Lord, okay? And Christ died and rose again that he would be the Lord, both of the living and the dead. That, that we our lives would be totally given over to him. So we limit the freedom that we have for any particular activity because, again, we are not our own. We're serving Christ. And Paul writes here, for if we serve Christ in these things, we're acceptable to God. The word acceptable means that we're pleasing to God and we're approved by men. The word approved means that we are honored, actually respected by men. Get that. So if we are living with an attitude and actions, a heart in which, okay, I'm not living for myself just to make me happy. I'm living, first of all, for Jesus because he gave his life for me. I live for him 100%. And I live for others as well because that's the cross. Christ didn't do it for himself. He did it for others. He did it for the whole world. That is the heartbeat of Calvary. And so if we serve Christ in this way, get this, we're pleasing to God and get this, we're, it, will, it will be honored and respected by people because it's an attitude of love. So Paul goes on to say in verses 19 through 21, you can see it there. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Again, that could go to be applied to anything. All things, get that, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Again, there's the new covenant. It's evil for the one who eats with offense because we're not talking about, okay, I've got, a, I've got a scripture and verse for it. It's in the heart. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Now, when Paul writes here at the beginning of verse 19, it begins it by, with the word therefore. So meaning with all of this being said, Paul says, let us, use that plural pronoun, us, there in verse 19, let us, including himself, so this, this command, okay, and call is a command and a call that is collective to the whole body of Christ. Let us pursue the things which make for peace among the body of Christ. And, and edify, that means encourages the faith of others. And so he, he, he says here, continuing on in verse 21, it is good neither to eat meat nor to drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. You see, again, that is the new covenant. That's the law of love. That we don't do anything 
that would make another brother weak in the faith. And we and we know it would make them weak in the faith. Now there may be things, and you know, get as I think about it, it is true, I believe, of every single one of us. That is, if you don't live in a cave and you're around other people, every one of us at some point have we've offended someone else. We have maybe done something that has weakened the faith of another believer or grieved another believer. Most likely we have. I I believe every one of us have if we lived very long for the Lord and we're around other believers. But it should be our heart, as Paul is, is, is stating here, that we don't do that. Okay, that we don't do that. And that leads us to the next set of verses, verses 22 and 23, where Paul writes this. He says, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. That's that's some unusual verses there, statements. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, Paul in these statements here, in verses 22 and 23, is primarily making these statements to the strong. Uh, He mentions here, verse 22, do you have faith? Question, do you have faith? The idea is faith in Christ that is at the very heart of everything you do. Do you have true faith? Okay. He Then he says this in verse 22. He says, have it to yourself before God. Okay. Have it to yourself before God. Now, when Paul makes that statement, okay, do you have faith? And then have it to yourself before God. He's meaning about our own personal convictions that we have w- from God. Okay. And before him. Have it, have that faith and your own personal convictions before God, okay, to yourself, okay, alone is the idea. And what Paul is meaning here is two primary things I want to bring out. In other words, our own personal convictions that are in, grounded in your faith in Jesus. Number one, keep it private. Keep it private. In other words, don't parade or be obnoxious or make public the point that you are stronger in the faith that and uh, that of others because you don't have such restrictions or you do have such restrictions okay Wh- whether you think you're strong or weak whatever don't don't parade that before others that's the point paul is making he's saying have it to yourself Number two, the point Paul's making is, at the same time, don't renounce the freedom that you have in Christ. Keep it. It's good. Okay, the faith that we have before Christ, that's a wonderful thing. The personal convictions that you have, it's wonderful. That is, if it's grounded in faith. That's why Paul would write here in verse 22, happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Okay, so happy, praise God for it. You see the point Paul's making? Then he says in verse 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. You see, for Paul, it's it's not only a matter of behavior and out external actions. What's even more important than that is that than that is motivation. That's what what Paul is meaning here. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he doesn't do it from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. It's not. It's, so it's not about so much the external, even though that is important. It's about the motivation. It's about the motivation. That is the rule. Okay, love being from faith, and so the, this principle okay, is what we can judge and what we can use to judge what some refer to as the gray areas. Again, it's those non-essentials. And I know there are believers out there, and I've been in this way myself, that would say, well, there's no gray areas. 
with the Lord. It's either black or it's white. It's either sin or it's not sin. Well, at the very heart of it, yes, that's true. It's either sin or it's not sin. But what Paul is saying here is there are things that go way beyond the externals. In other words, you can be eating and drinking something in which another believer looks at that and says, oh no, not me. Bless the Lord. That is a sin to do that. But get this, what Paul's saying is if that believer and this and it's the strong believers in this case, okay, that don't have the limitations on them in this particular case that Paul is talking about. There are believers that are eating and drinking and they're eating from faith and between them and God, they're pleasing God. There's nothing wrong with it at all. But the other believers are going to look at it and say, oh no, that is sin. Paul, again, in this whole passage is making the point, and I keep stating it over and over again for emphasis, that what unites us is greater than what divides us. So everything that we do as a child of God, okay, should be governed by, is it being done from a, from a heart of faith? Literally, it's out of faith, out of a heart of faith in Christ and what he has accomplished. Is it being done in love? That I'm putting the other person first before me. I'm not living for myself. Again, that's the gospel. I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm living for Christ. And I'm, I'm living for those whom Christ died for. Okay? And so that is what governs our heart. Now, so with this said, let's continue into chapter 15 and the first several verses there of chapter 15. He says there, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. But what a powerful verse is here. But Paul's just continuing the same thought from chapter 14, that those who are strong in the faith have a greater responsibility than those who are weak in the faith. And in this passage, again, being strong in the faith mean, means that we are truly not living for ourselves, but we're living for Christ who died for us and who died for others. Okay? And, and so he said there to the strong, bear with the scruples of those who are weak. What does that mean, the scruples of those who are weak? Well, first of all, the words bear with literally are the words bear up. And they do not carry this the idea of putting up with or just tolerating or when you're around that other individual or individuals, plural, that you just, you know, you're, you're rolling your eyes and you're just, you know, putting up with it, you know, until they leave, okay? That's not what Paul is saying here. Bearing up, okay, means that the actions and the attitude of the strong helps the weaker become stronger in the faith, okay? Our actions and our attitudes actually help them be stronger in the faith. It pulls them up. And so we're not looking down upon the weak, or those who we disagree with, whether they're weak or strong, whatever. We're not despising them, as Paul would say, don't do, earlier in chapter 14. Despising means the, that we don't look upon them as worthless or of no value. And we don't judge them wrongly as, as if you know everything they're doing is sin, or they're, they're, they're sinning, or they're in a, in a, in a sinful condition. But again, because we're not, they're not exactly like us, okay? We don't do that. That doesn't bring people up. That actually brings more division. But our actions and attitude, when we operate in love, and we operate in, in unselfishness, okay, but we're looking out for others, that action and attitude brings others up, okay? And it doesn't bring others up into our likeness, but into the likeness of Jesus. So, this is so important, okay, that we bear up one another. Now, this doesn't mean, this is so important as well, this doesn't mean that believers, okay, 
that we should be ruled by the weaknesses of the weak, but that our actions and attitude, again, help bring others up, help bring, make this faith of others stronger. That is what it is meant with by bearing up with the scruples. And the word scruples is an unusual translation. It just simply means weaknesses. It's, it's the same word for weaknesses back in chapter 14 and verse 1. So bear up, bear up in, a, in an edifying way, the weaknesses of the weak, okay? And so Christ is our example. He's our motivator for not living to please ourselves, but to edify others. It's the same principle that Paul explained and taught in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where Paul said this, he said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that is humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. I want to say that again. Does that mean that we are ruled by every insecurity, you know, and every weakness that other believers have? No, it does not mean that. It does not mean that. But it does mean that we are looking out for other believers and what could potentially offend them or grieve them and hurt them and weaken their faith in any area okay we're looking out for others so that is the point then paul goes on the right in in verses four through six these last several verses of this passage for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse 3, Paul is quoting from Psalm 69 and verse 9, and he makes the statement, okay, that Christ that took upon himself the reproaches of others upon himself. Again, he's quoting, Paul is quoting scripture, Psalm 69 and verse 9. And then he makes that statement here in verse 4 about whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The point Paul is making is that the Christian liberty that we have, okay, in Christ under the new covenant is grounded in the Old Testament scriptures, in particular, the point that Paul's making, that we don't live for ourselves, okay, but for others, for ultimately for God and for Jesus and then for others, that, okay, which is the very heart of the new covenant, the very reason why Christ went to the cross, okay, that is grounded in the Old Testament scriptures, and through the scriptures, okay, we learn to endure, we learn uh, to have comfort, okay, we learn to have hope. All of that comes through the scriptures. So as a child of God, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we may not have a scripture and verse for everything, but on the main things, okay, we have scripture and verse, and we should be, as believers, we should be, it is written, type of believers. That's what Paul was, and we should too. Now Paul's closing prayer in this whole passage, get this, his closing prayer that we as believers would be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ, that we should be of one mind with, and with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Now get this, being like-minded the way that Paul was describing here in this passage, like-minded and being of one mind, means that our minds, that's our thinking and believing, are governed by the same love that motivated Jesus to the cross. That's the, that's the one mind and one mouth that we should have, okay? That we have the same love that governed Jesus to go to the cross. We're governed by the agape love of Christ. And let me add this in here because it's really in that one love that we have the same dependency upon Jesus 
and what he's accomplished at the cross, that he died to save us from our sins. And again, again, going back to Romans 14, 7 through 9, he died that we would not live for ourselves, but live for him and live for others. Are we governed by that? That's what that's the one mind that we should have. Okay? Being of one mind, okay, like-minded. Paul was not meaning that we should separate into groups, okay? The weak over there, they're of one mind, and the strong over here, they're of one mind. Paul was not doing that. Get this. What Paul was explaining in this passage is that the weak and the strong can have the same mind. One is allowing certain things, and the other is not allowing certain things. But you see, what unites us is greater than what divides us. Okay, And what Paul was bringing out in this passage, that what some believers allow and what some believers don't allow, that is... Should not e- that should not even divide us as believers. We, we should rise above that. Now, what all of this said, and I keep saying that with all of this said, but with that said, let me add this thought to it as we come to a close, that what Paul was not dealing with was moral issues. For example, when I say moral issues, I'm talking about this, that, that you know, watching immoral things pornography okay that that is not even an issue of christian liberty now those who would take grace as a license to sin that i can live any way i want to okay that at the very core is wrong because it's not it's not from faith and paul said it again at the end of chapter 14 whatever is not from faith to him, it is sin. So, okay, so it, what I'm, what, this Christian liberty is not using grace as a license to sin. It's not dealing with moral issues. Again, like watching things that are sexually immoral. Vulgar language, cuss words, okay? Th- there, there are some who would say, well, that, that does fall under the category uh, of, of Christian liberty. I would say that that there's a line there that can be crossed okay there's a line there that can be crossed and paul would even say and excuse me i don't have chapter and verse but he would even say it that there should be no coarse language that comes out of our mouth and what he was meant by that was was crude cussing things like that should not be coming out of our mouth so do we have some Christian liberty on some things that we say? I believe absolutely yes. But there are some moral issues, okay? Crudeness, the, the, the cuss words that should not be coming out of our mouth. Some things that we as believers, like, for example, pornography, um, sexual content, nudity, there, there's things that we should never come before the believer's eyes, that we shouldn't even entertain that. Do you get the point? And there are certain other activities that we should have nothing, no part to do with. We should avoid, as Paul would write, we, we should avoid the, the appearance of evil. And as Paul would write here in this passage, as I close, we should not do anything that would grieve knowingly. I, I, mean, I mean that that we know that we would grieve the, the faith of another believer. This is so huge. Faith and love should rule the heart of you and I as children of God towards God and toward other people. That is the heart of the cross. Hallelujah. God bless you. I pray that this has been a help to you today. May we always live knowing that what unites us, and that is our our love and our dependency for Jesus, who he is and what he's done for us at the cross, okay, and the fact that he's risen from the dead, that what unites us is greater than what divides us. And again, that is not giving a license to just sin, not at all. Again, grace actually causes us 
to live within a stricter boundary because we're not living for ourselves and we're not living with an attitude of, okay, is there a scripture and verse, okay, that limits the, we're not li living with that because grace, okay, and the Holy Spirit working on the inside can put a check in our heart towards something that is not necessarily a sin and say, don't do that. Don't do it for the sake of others and even for yourself. Don't do that. I pray that you've been blessed today. God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus.